this is the continuation of the book of Acts, and we're going to tie in so many cool things. Not only the book of Acts, but we've got also the, the Torah portion and the half Torah. I'll just touch on that at the very end. But what actually took place after the Holy Spirit came down in the upper room? Let's look at Acts chapter 2. It's verses 36 through 47. 3,000 baptized is the title. 3,000 baptized. Amen. 3,000 baptized is the title. So let's read along. If it's too small, I'm sorry, but I think, it, I think you can make it. Let's check it out here. Verse 36 of chapter 2. Here's Peter witnessing now. Therefore... Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Just stay right there. So the apostle Peter's talking. He's, he's, he's saying, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, right? He goes in and he says, come out of this untoward generation. Now I want you to understand something. Keep it in context. Geographically speaking, where is he saying this? In Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. (laughs) You know, and and I want to just reiterate that, you know, to reiterate that the fact of him saying this untoward generation, untoward means crooked. It's the Greek word scolios. It's where you get scoliosis. And so what I want to try to share with all of you is that we all have a sort of bent. We have a bent about us that, that, that it's not a good bent, and we need to be adjusted, amen? Uh, I went to the chiropractor just recently, just a, maybe a couple weeks ago, and I thought, man, you know, I'm doing well. I'm doing great. You know what I mean? It's probably been just, what, maybe a, a month or two since I've been. I wasn't there for four months. I hadn't been to the chiropractor in four months, and I thought, well, I feel great, I feel, you know, all this. But, boy, when you get adjusted with a good chiropractor, it, it, it just makes you feel like you're almost born again. It really does, because you got to put things in order. You know, um, and I'm only bringing that up because we all have to find our way. So I just want to just share with you that this was taking place in the Temple Mount area. So he's basically telling these people that were worshiping and Israelites and the priests, hey, you know what? This culture is bent. It's, it's got scoliosis. It's crooked. It's crooked. And uh, he says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they gladly uh, received his word and were baptized. I want you to understand something, okay? Now, in the golden calf incident, 3,000 died at the hands of the Levites. In Exodus 32, verse 28. At the hand of the Levites, that's where their house was really strengthened, um, they took... Uh, they took the judgment seriously and, and, and they uh, meted out the judgment of 3,000 souls died. Now notice that here it says 3,000 souls were baptized. So I want to submit to you that it is believed that the reference of the upper room was actually a place on the Temple Mount. So if you let Scripture interpret Scripture, if you keep it in context, how many of you know that if they were an upper room and isolated and the Holy Spirit came down, nobody would see the manifestation but those in the room. So when they say, hey, let's go to the upper room in Jerusalem, it's just an idea. Or let's go to the tomb of Jesus, like a tomb like Jesus would have perhaps been in. 
So, so what I want to submit to you is that when it says the upper room, it was a place on the Temple Mount. Now, I've not studied it thoroughly, but I have studied it enough to know to be dangerous, that it is believed that different sects of rabbis would have their group of students. They were the master, and there's the students. He's the rabbi. Here are the disciples, the students, you know. And so they would meet in sections before they would actually make their way to wherever the final destination would be. So when you say the the upper room, it was actually a place on the Temple Mount. Because why? Because you would have to see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit for the people to say and do what they did. Okay, so we're going to talk about this a little more because being Pentecostal or Assembly of God from Sebring, the Holy Spirit is really awesome. But I want to really help all of you, and and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be totally honest and upfront. We're going to have to fight for the Holy Spirit. Because those familiar spirits are fighting for us. I'm no exception. I know. I'm no exception. You know, I got a receding hairline, but I do have bad hair days. Somebody said to me, you know, Pastor Nick, I got up on the wrong side of the bed. I said, push your bed against the wall. And I love what Eddie said. That was really encouraging what Eddie said for all of us. We just all need to be encouraged. Amen. We're not the enemy. We're not the enemy. This is not the enemy. We're not the enemy. We don't fight flesh and blood. So we need to understand that because this whole thing about the Holy Spirit is really bigger than we even know. So I want to submit that to you because it's very important that you understand that. Now notice that, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. See, doctrine is what you do. Theology is what you think. Okay. So we've established certain things at this church that we expect you to to adhere by, to look at. But I mean, you know, there are some debates, there are theories, there's things that are going on. I understand all that. But don't try to drag that in here. How many of you that the calendar is controversial? Wow. I mean, it is controversial, you know, especially in regards to the new moon and all these other things. So what we have done is we do follow the lunar calendar. We do follow what the Jewish people are doing. Those that practice Judaism, we do practice that. We follow that uh, so that we can all be on the same page. But there's a Karaite calendar. There is an Essene calendar. There's all kinds of different calendars and things. So we want to be careful that we don't just become so dogmatic on something like that that we just we lose the fact that, hey, let's all be on the same page while we can. That's why every PowerPoint is the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, I have many other translations that I love to read and do. But for the sake of teaching and following along, I ask that you bring your King James Bible. Share it that way, amen. Um, And so it's exciting. Uh, I just discovered not too long ago the modern English version, which is kind of interesting. I love to just read to read. You know, you don't have to have any commentary or cross-reference. Just read a different translation, like the Amplified or whatever. Brings a lot into play. So I'm greasing the skids here, just laying out a foundation, because we're going to get into now in Acts chapter 2, verses 43 through 47. Let's check it out. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. One of the things you need to understand is that you have authority. Notice that they did wonders and signs. So here's a little list of what you have authority over. It's not all inclusive, but this is what you have authority over. And you need to speak these things. You have the authority to preach the good news, the gospel from the Old and New Testament. Amen. You have the authority to do that. You have the authority to heal the sick in his name. You have authority. Someone doesn't feel well, let me pray for you. You don't say, hey, well, I'll pray for you and then pray for them later. Just right there, just pray for them. Hey, uh, oh, you're not feeling well, let me pray for you. We have authority to cast out devils. We have authority. You can cast them out of yourself. <laughs> say, hey, something's not right here. And, 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 you know, it's like a glass of water. You know, well, can a Christian have a demon or does a demon have a Christian? If you take a glass of water, you can drop a stone in it. Think about it. 
I'll give you an example. So Peter, through the revelation of the Father, right? What does he do? You're the Christ. What did Jesus say? Well, you didn't get this on your own. My Father revealed it to you through a download. He got inspired to know that Jesus is the Christ. Then what happened not too long later? Satan entered his heart to try to stop the whole operation of him to go to Jerusalem to suffer, die, and be buried and be raised again. He even says it. Get behind me, Satan. That was Peter. Peter probably had a bad day that day. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you could be on top of the world, you could be prophesied, do all kinds of things, then all of a sudden be inspired or influenced by a spirit or a devil. Amen? So, so you have the uh, authority to perform signs, wonders, and miracles. And last but not least, you have the authority to raise the dead. You need to know these things in his name. You know, Yeshua says, I go to the Father. Greater works than these shall you do. We need to be practicing. We need to be a part of it. We need to be jumping in on it. Amen. Don't have low self-esteem at this point in time. We need, we need to all rise up. You know? Now notice it says that, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. He added. God adds and the devil subtracts. God multiplies, and the devil divides. Amen? We have to catch ourselves. Tell me what you're for, not what you're against. So now all of a sudden, they have this big revival, and he's preaching at the Temple Mount area, and what happens? 3,000 get baptized. Now, the Jews aren't going to think anything of this. The priests aren't going to think anything of this. Wow, the mikvah pool's full today. Because they were doing mikvahs. But this time they were doing baptisms. Amen? You know, when, when, the, when the flood hit the earth, and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and the flood waters were raised, God gave the earth a mikvah. And he saved eight souls on a boat. That was the baptism of Noah and his family. How many know what I'm talking about? And so then what happens? Then, of course, what comes around? All of a sudden, the children of Israel got to go through the wall of water on left and the right. Do they not? On dry ground. They had to be baptized. They had to do the, the, the ceremonially righteous mikvah, right, as they left Egypt. Isn't that what you do? Come out of this untoward generation. They repent. They're baptized. They're saved, right? Well, they're leaving Egypt, which represents the world, like us. We come to have faith in Christ, and then we're going through the water. What did Yeshua do? He comes along and says, hey, John the Baptist, you're going to mikvah me. It's the ceremonial part of the law, okay? Yeshua did the mikvah for the ceremonial sake of the baptism. He, he did it for righteousness' sake. Did he not say that? So I want to show you something that's very interesting because through the water baptism, what God is saying to the lesser Elohim, that divine council, those spirits that are over nations and everything, he's saying that these children are mine. They've confessed, they believe in their heart, and they're going to be mikvahed. They're going to do the, 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 the baptism in the name of the Godhead. These children are mine. They're not under your jurisdiction anymore. They're not under your jurisdiction anymore. Now, what are you saying, Pastor Nick? I highly recommend Dr. Michael Heiser, the unseen realm. Great theologian. See, we're so, and I'm just as guilty. If there's anybody that's in the flesh, it's me. If anybody commit the 17 works of the flesh, I'd be a great candidate. But what I'm trying to tell you is that the spiritual realm was here first. So if you get so much into the natural realm, so much into the flesh, so much in your senses, you're going to lose the sense of the spiritual realm. Like Daniel prayed. Remember Daniel prayed. God heard his prayer right when he prayed it, but he had to wait to get a response. Aren't you guys waiting for an answer to prayer? I know you are. Some of you have prayed. He's already heard it. But what was said of the angel? The angel was telling Daniel what? Listen, God already heard your prayer. But the prince of Persia resisted. Oh, and the prince of Grecia is coming. These are principalities over nations. I, I, I got goosebumps. Let me tell you how special every one of you are. You have a choice to make in this year. Going into the summer months, you have a choice to make whose you are. Are you God's or are you Satan's? Because if you're in the world, you're his. You must make a clean distinction. You have to. 
Because these nations that are run by the principalities are tightening up the screws. They're, they're tightening up some things. They're, they're committing atrocities, tyranny. Vladimir Putin has no military experience whatsoever. He was KGB, Secret Service or whatever, like a detective or whatever, the KGB. He has no military experience. But look at what he's doing out of spite. What about Syria? Syria has been in civil war for many, many years. Syria and Damascus, that whole area. Tyranny all over the world. Why is there so much tyranny? I'm telling you right now, there's more tyranny in dictators today than any other time we've ever lived. Add it up. North Korea. Principalities. But here's where it gets to be kind of scary. Now you've got these dictators, these tyrants, with nuclear weapons. I have a bad day. I can come home, kick the dog. I don't have a dog. But let's say you're a dictator. Let's say you're a tyrant and you've got it in for somebody. You know that Vladimir Putin has threatened this earth with nuclear weapons. Out of his mouth. If NATO joins, if NATO, we're going we're gonna to do something. We're, we're gonna, we'll show you. No holds barred. So, so I want you to understand that as we develop this storyline. Because look what's going to happen now. We have the healing of the lame in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 26. How many of the, a lot of people needed healing? Because of their own fault, because of their upbringing, whatever it is, they needed healing. So let's look at Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Let's jump right in here. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, which is 9 a.m., and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms, and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Verse 5. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I have none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Whew. Verse 8. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. He looked like a frog. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. From his birth, he was lame. We all, listen, as a pastor, we all have to recognize the need for Jesus. Please understand this. We need Jesus now more than ever. We need Jesus. And that name is so powerful. So we got to come to that place where we recognize the need so that Jesus can meet it. I've never arrived. I've never been complacent. I've never been just comfortable. He's always throwing something at me. I did all these outlines, the Torah outline, the prophet outline, all these outlines. And then he says, oh, you're going to do Matthew now. Oh, man, it takes hours to do those outlines. Can I get a break, Lord? I can just pull up the old Torah questionnaire. No, you're going to be in the Gospels. You're going to be in the New Testament for right now. So look at Acts. What verse is this? I guess it's a continuation of verse 10. Look at this. In faith, look at this, in faith. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Did you guys see that? And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong. Remember Yeshua would go to people and say, do you believe? See, do you believe that I can do this? Do you believe that you can be healed? And they say, yes. Then the faith kicks in, right? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. 
Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what are you believing for? When everybody was coming up and the young people, I said, do you believe that through the laying on of hands, you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I didn't want to just haphazardly do it. I wanted to look at it. Even the young people, the, the sons and the daughters, your children. I'm telling you, God is moving in this church. I could see it in their eyes. Seeds are planted. Places are being set up. We'll talk about that a little later. But I asked them, do you believe? And they said, yes, I believe. And then I proceeded to pray for them. Because that's the biblical way to do it. Does everybody understand that? So all of a sudden, it's like the Hebrews movement. You know, this, this thing with the Hebrews has come in here and it's poured into us, isn't it? The Hebrews has been poured into Beit Dehila, man. We got Hebrew roots. We got some serious roots. You can't pull up these roots. They are deep. And now it's going out. Now things are happening, right? Paul and the Pickering got to have a special meeting with Marco Rubio. They're meeting people. They're talking to people. So there's all kinds of cool things happening. He says, I'll bring you before kings and queens. You know? So everybody knew that this guy was lame. He was lame. He couldn't walk. He was at the gate. And all of a sudden, this guy's, they're seeing him jumping and running. Wow. Wow. In the name. There was a situation at City Hall in Tampa where they okayed prayer and prayer was okay. One of the ministers, ministers there prayed in Jesus' name and it caused a big ruckus just because he said the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, he goes, they pulled him off to the side like, you know, you can say your prayers, but you can't say in the name of Jesus. They tried to start something, but they lost. The city council. Oh, you can pray to God and pray to God and oh God, but that person prayed in the name of Jesus. All of a sudden, oh, things got stirred up. Ha, 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 you know, because that's a powerful name. What a beautiful name it is. Oh, what a beautiful name it is. You know what worship does? Notice that Josiah is not here, Erica Joy's not here, but we have an awesome worship team. I'm just saying, right? I'm just saying, everything's happening in this church just like God gave me the vision. Our young people are going to run this place. He even encouraged me when I was praying for the young people. They're going to warn us. Guess what? Some of the things the young people are going to say are going to be towards judgment. Even Samuel, the little prophet boy, had to tell Eli, you're going to die, you and your sons. They're going to pronounce judgment. But they're also going to foretell events. We're going to talk about this as we move along. Because I'm telling you, there's a fresh move of the Spirit of God in this place. There's something happening here. There's something happening here, and you can't make this stuff, you just can't make this stuff up. So if you're on Hulu and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and whatever you're doing, hopscotch, I'm going to tell you, you're going to miss God. You won't even know what he's doing or where he's at because you're already absorbed into the God of this world. I'm not against social media. I'm not against that. I'm just saying, I watch a little bit of TV. I'm just telling you. I can't even put this together. This is unbelievable. Look at Acts chapter 3, verses 20 through 22, about restoration. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Stay right there. Since the world began, the restitution is the restoration. Do you see that? It's the Greek word for restitution is apokatastasis. Apokatastasis. It's a, rest, a restoration of a thing to its former state. Now notice Peter addresses to the whole house of Israel. Let the whole house of Israel know. Really? So what are you saying, Pastor Nick? What I'm saying is that if Israel once was, Israel will be again. Yeah. So how he takes the kingdom apart is how he puts the kingdom back together. 
The church is not spiritual Israel. And then there's the physical Israel, the Jews. No, no, you can't, you can't dissect it like that. We're a spirit, a soul, and a body. So what's happening is, geographically speaking, if, if he, of course, saw the northern kingdom went into captivity, in the Assyrian captivity, 722, and then in 586, you had Judah going into captivity. What's happening? He's bringing the captivity back from Judah, and now here comes Ephraim. And now there's a nation called Israel. Now there's a nation called Israel. A restoration of a thing to its former state. Listen to me closely, everybody. And it's just the last 2,000 years of the church age, this is what's happened, okay? We've been taught eschatology, but we've not been taught the promises of God. We've not been taught the promises of God. We've not been taught who you are and who he is and who you are in him. Because if you don't know who you are, you don't know where you're going. I want you to understand the reverse psychology that the devil has used, and and even in in the form of eschatology, because they're they're ignorant, they're harmless, they don't don't mean any better. It seems to me that the eschatology that we've been taught is to stay away from Jewish people in Israel. Would you agree? But it's the opposite of what God wants. God wants us to be with Jewish people. God wants us to go to Israel. Thank you, Holy Spirit. If you study your Bible and you look at Ephraim and Judah, I found this as a template. I found this, and I've known this since 1995. Different things would happen. Events are going to unfold. Hear me out on this. And I want to spark you. I want to quicken you. Don't go home and check your emails. Get out your Strong's Concordance. When Ephraim and Judah come together, every situation, every example in the Bible, they defeat the enemy. No, you can go and read it. And if you can't define Ephraim, then you're lost. You have to define Ephraim. Who is Ephraim? Who is Ephraim? What is he doing? Where is he at? What's going on? Where is she? It's life-changing, the message that is coming today, even now, from me. It's life-changing. It's not going to come back null and void. All these messages is going out to do something. doesn't matter who's here. Half the people are here. Half the people are gone. Half the people are at the mall. Some are at the flea market. It doesn't matter. When I speak this, it comes towards me. It comes towards me. I don't know how excited you are, but God says, I'm, I'm coming for you. I'm going to gather you. It was almost like an audible voice. I'm going to gather you. I'm coming for you. Everything's timing. Look at how quick the doors open for Israel. And now you don't have to do a COVID test to come back to the States. It's all just a bunch of smoke and mirrors. <laughs> I'm just saying, we get all worked up over these laws. They change every hour. TSA, those people probably have to give free counseling. <laughs> Within 24 hours, the laws change. Oh, I didn't get that memo. No, I'm telling you. Wow, that must have just happened. Amen? Amen? But let's go on in Acts chapter 3, verses 22. Look, look what it says here as far as the prophet. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. This is Peter's discourse. He's saying that the prophet would come. The prophet was Jesus. How many of you know that? Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15, uh, verses 18 and 19. That prophet was Yeshua. You better listen to him is what he was saying. Was he not saying that in Deuteronomy? Wow, listen, 3,500 years ago, he's saying that Jesus is going to come and he's that prophet. He's saying that in Deuteronomy. Hear me out on this. Guess what? It's only been 2,000 years since the death, burial, and resurrection. So what are you saying, Pastor? Boy, we are on borrowed time, I think. Now, we can all say what we want to say and believe what we want to believe. I I believe we are the generation that will see the return of the Messiah. I just believe it. I just believe it. I see things happening so fast. Can a nation be born in a day? Yes. It only takes 30 seconds to, to probably be born again. This is why when I do a funeral or I do a memorial service, I don't know where these people are. I hope they're in heaven. But who are we to get up there and say they went to hell? They never gave their life to the Lord. It only takes like 30 seconds to get saved. We don't even know their last state. We don't even know the last few moments of their life. Amen? 
Yeshua says you'll know them by their fruit. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Judge means rendering a decision on somebody. You better wait because they can change. People can change. You're going to see this in Saul of Tarsus. You need to understand this stuff. So when they say, oh, Jesus can come any minute, I no, there's a lot of things that have to happen. But they can happen quickly. They can happen quickly. This is why it's so important that we hook up with the Jewish people. They've been with so many Jewish people, I think most of them changed their last names. Josiah says, hi, Dad, it's me, Josiah Plummerberg. Hi, this is Pastor Tifa Kolbostein. Kolboberg. We're coming home. It's funny. And, and, and when you see those pictures, look at the faces of the Jewish people and how happy they are. I want you to look at their faces. Look at their faces. They're beautiful. They're like, he's alive. Amen. They're encouraged. So now all hell breaks loose in the religious sector of life. Peter and John are brought before the Jewish leaders. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7 in Acts 4, Peter and John. Is everybody ready? Here we go. So they're doing the work, and now here comes the enemy. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them. This was not a good laying on of hands. And put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Verse 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Man, this must be the first mega church. They didn't have emails or phones. The number of the men was about 5,000 that believed. 5,000 people. Verse 7. When they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? What gives you the right? The religious leaders questioned the disciples' authority. Listen, a lot of people don't understand the reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles. A lot of people don't understand the mutual respect that can follow between Judaism and Christianity. So when people say, oh, you know, like someone sent, me, sent us an email, oh, Pastor Nick's leading the people into Judaism. No, I'm leading them into their, the promises of God. I'm leading them into the prophecies. I have in my Bible, and I won't get into it, right here, a number of verses of, of the prophets that talk about that the Gentiles, right, the nations, a people would come out of the nations and help Jewish people. <laughs> Say, that's me. That's us. That's what we've been called to do and to be. You don't understand how powerful it is to have somebody from Israel that's practicing Judaism or Jew to come into our church. They're not allowed to go in the churches. They risk everything to extend a hand to us. They're blacklisted, blackballed, because they go into a church. Just so you understand, because we, we believe in the Godhead, they think we worship three gods. We're idolaters. God forbid you're a Jew in a church. Now you're committing idolatry with them. They risk it all to extend a hand to us. All we can do is give it back. Amen? Amen? That's all we can do is give it back. By what power, you know? In Acts chapter 4, verses 20 through 22, let's continue on, verse 20. Here's what their response is. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was about 40 years old, on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Think about that man that was 40 years old and he was a cripple his whole life. Think about his viewpoint. He's seeing everything at a low level. Now he's healed. He's 40 years old. He's a man. And now he's seeing everything from what? Another paradigm. 
another perspective. Listen to me. The Hebrew roots of the Christian faith movement is a paradigm. God wants you to see things in a greater, better way. There's a better way than dating. It's called betrothal. God tells us what to eat and what not to eat. There's clean and unclean. It's a principle. God has given us his his feast days, amen? We have his feast days. We don't have to celebrate the pagan holidays because God invented barbecue. He's the one that wants to party like it's 1999. Think about it. He brings the best wine for the first miracle with Yeshua. He said, for my time has not come, but he went and did it anyway. Why? Because he honored his mother. His mother asked him to do it. I try to tell my kids, mommy brought you into this world. Mommy will take you out. And I'm not going to be a witness. I can't support that. Right? Right? When mama's not happy, nobody's happy, folks. No, I'm serious. So there's going to be some conflict because of this. How many of you understand that? The man was lame from the time of his birth. He was healed at 40, which means testing. But look who was getting tested, the religious people. Remember it rained 40 days and nights on Noah's flood? How long was Moses up on the mountain fasting, receiving the Torah? 40 days. How long were the children of Israel in the wilderness? 40 years. How long was Yeshua in the wilderness to be tested? 40 days. Amen. Amen. The apostles seek courage from God in prayer. Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. Let's continue to read. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? So think about it. If they're referencing a portion of Scripture, you need to go back and read the, kind of the whole thing. Keep it in context. Because this is a messianic psalm. I'm just going to highlight a couple things that are found in this psalm that's very interesting. Because remember, Peter and John were saying, we can only do what we've seen and heard. How many people did Yeshua heal that they saw? right? And then he set them out to do it. Remember that? It was like on the job training. Then he set them out. I think he even said something along the lines of don't rejoice because the demons are cast out, but rejoice because you have eternal life. (laughs) I mean, yeah, that's, I'd rather have eternal life. Door number one, cast out devils. Door number two, eternal life. I'll take door number two. Rejoice because you have eternal life. Why? Because there's no end to every one of you. Listen to me closely. I'm learning to meditate. I'm learning to sit in a chair. This is not new age. And really sit in a chair. Nobody's around. I close my eyes and I begin to meditate on the the Lord's word. I'll read a verse and I'll close my eyes and I'll start thinking about it. And I chew on it. And I just wait for some kind of a reflection or a response because that's going to get rid of all that chaos and confusion that's running through your mind. Listen to me closely. I'm telling you from my own heart, I feel so much better now that I've broken away from this culture than I've ever felt before in my life. Not that I don't indulge in some of it. Because here's the deal. You need to understand the law of the brain. It's a computer. Everything you see and hear, it files away. Long-term, short-term, your subconscious, you need to understand. This is a big old computer up here. And everything you see, everything you hear is being filed away in your brain. So guess what? The less you see and hear of the world, the better you're going to feel. You're going to feel so much better. You're going to feel so much better. I'm just saying, I like to watch old football games on YouTube. No commercials, just watch them, just two teams playing or whatever. But it's, like, but it's like you have to really watch what you're seeing. You have to be careful. You have to watch it. Because this is what's interesting. He's quoting Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The anointed one is the title of the psalm. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? Look at this. He says in verse 7, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. What was David doing? He was creating a messianic psalm. 
He went in the spirit. He's, he's, doing a, he's a psalmist. He's playing the harp. He's coming up with these messianic psalms about the Messiah because King David was the only king that was a prophet, priest, and king. And notice, it always reflects the Messiah and what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. Now listen, think about all the generations up until today. My own father passed away. Okay, my grandfather. Let's go back to the 1900s, 1800s. Think about all these generations. Look at the generation you're living in right now. You have the Torah and you have the Spirit. You're a Hebrew costal. Never before in the history of the earth has anything been done like this. The church skipped Mount Sinai for 2,000 years. God gets a hold of you and takes you back to Mount Sinai to show you his marriage covenant. Exodus 19 is all about a marriage covenant. And Yeshua came to renew that marriage covenant. Listen, I've had the honor of knowing this stuff since 1995. But I'm still learning, expanding, growing, connecting the dots. But this is my favorite part, everybody. We're not waiting to go there. We're there. We're here. And if you didn't learn from Miss Libby Davis and counting the Omer, how serious she was, and she was locked and cocked, had her notes, her PowerPoint, she laid it on the line for you. I'm sitting there thinking, man, I'm undone. Little Josiah's up here with that thing just grinding, right? And I'm like, man, that's me. I mean, he broke it. Jason, what? He just kept grinding to the thing just broken on the stage. I'm going to break you. <laughs> that's a famous line, isn't it? And, and, and so I'm just telling you that you better take heed. He said he's going to gather the wheat into the barn. When the angels come, to, when the judgment comes, the tares are removed first. So if you're not in the barn, where are you? Not where you need to be. You got to be at the right place at the right time. Let me, let me close with this in, in Acts chapter 4, because we're talking about this psalm. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 12, listen to this. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. Show him intimacy, because he's already shown it to you. God breathed into our nostrils the breath of life, and we became a living soul. Did you know that to bring something to life, you have to go through the nose? The mouth resuscitates. He created life by breathing into your nose. Breathing. The nostrils, the breath of life. That's why when you're resuscitated, you don't do CPR through somebody's nose. We weren't resuscitated. We were created. Listen closely when you leave here today. God wants you to participate with him in what he's doing in the earth right now. He wants you to participate. And as we go each and every day, every week, by the Spirit, God will reveal to us the things that we need to be doing and that we will be doing. And if you want to participate, come and join us. But don't rock the boat. You can get out of the boat, but don't rock the boat. Did you know that the church is a place to give, not to get? We should be all ready to come and give something, to give to one another. We give of our offerings. We give of our praise. We can't come in here with our preconceived ideas. Well, I'm not getting this or that. I don't like this music or whatever. You lose. Next contestant. I'm just saying it doesn't work. I don't sit there and find fault. Well, I've talked to them after this. I can't believe they said that. I mean, where were the words? And Hey, what about this? I'm enjoying the service. I don't even know what half the stuff is going on in here. I don't, because I, I like the service. I'm a pastor that loves the service. I sit here and I enter in. I love to be in the service. I love to be with you all. I love the words. See, where's the day? I go, I don't know. My wife's asking me, where's the day? I have no idea. Go ask her. Find her. I'm not, I'm worshiping. Amen. Acts 4:31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. I just can't believe how bad the world is, to be honest with you. Really, this world is rotten to the core. It's rotten. It's so nasty. It's like we all have to have a mikvah pool in our living room or something, you know? We just have to have something like, you know, I, can't, I just can't believe how bad it really, really is. 
unless those days shall be shortened, no flesh is going to be saved. The believers had all things common in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Let's, let's move along. This is what happened after the Holy Spirit came down. Boy, there's a lot of activity, wasn't there? In Acts chapter 4, verses 32 and 33, these are, the, these are a couple of verses. Let's read it. One heart. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Care about one another. Now, common is the Greek word koinos. It means shared by all or several. How many of you that were here to help one another? We have benevolence. We have a benevolence committee. We have somebody that heads up benevolence. How many of you, if you need something, you come and get help. How many of you know that? You go to one another. Amen? You go to one another. All things in common. Help one another. Be there for one another. It's so important. Amen? So now we have some interesting things going on and we're going to see another example now with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Ananias and Sapphira. This kind of reminds me of what two people you think maybe in the Old Testament. Who? No. That, I said in the Bible. Very good. Thank you, Benjamin. Nadab and Abihu. Now listen, every one of us can be made an example. I'm not here to put down Ananias, Sapphira, or Nadab and Abihu, but Nadab and Abihu were actually some of the elders. They were, he, they were up on Mount Sinai with God celebrating the marriage covenant and eating with him. Did you know that? Look at uh, verses 1 and 2 of Acts 5. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so let's go to... Acts 5. I want to read this one verse, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart? What? To lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. So at one point, Ananias and Sapphira were in agreement by the Holy Spirit. And then something entered them to hold back what they had agreed to. I know sometimes when I'm doing an offering, I pray about the offering, and the Lord will show me. Give this amount. Give that amount. But look at this. Ananias and Sapphira's lives were taken by the Lord because they lied to the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, and then verse 10. Okay? So when there's a great move of God and people are careless, God takes them out. Amen? If there's carelessness in this movement, God will take you out. Many pioneers have made the way for us, and the Lord took them because it was time for them to go. But some people have been taken out because of a breach of promise. Or maybe they got full of themselves. Amen? Amen. But look what happens. I don't have time to get into it. How many of you know that... Um, after a tragedy among the children of Israel, there's usually a, 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 a time where they, they move on or God takes care of them. He does his damage control in public relations. You can go back and look after the golden calf, what happened at Baal Peor, what happened? They entered the promised land. So when there's a tragedy or something bad happens or something takes place, uh, God is moving. Remember, remember, look at the symbols. Look at the things that are going on. Look at the principle that's found. In Acts... Chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, many signs and wonders. Many signs and wonders. Why? They had authority. They had authority. Acts 5, 12, let's read it. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Do you see that? Signs and wonders. Acts chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, we have the shadow of Peter. This is incredible. Let's read it. Verse 15, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Remember, uh, 
unclean spirits. Uncleanness is one of the 17 works of the flesh. The shadow of Peter. The shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Think about that. Amen? I believe every one of you have the anointing of Peter. I really do. I believe you have the anointing of Peter. I really, really do. You need to know that you have the anointing. You need to know that every one of you in this house, you are a minister. You are an ambassador of Yeshua. You are an ambassador of Yeshua. You represent him. And he wants to use you. I'm telling all of you this from my heart. I can't believe for 19 years I've led this congregation. 19 years by God's grace and his mercy. I still can't believe he's taken me to 20 this, this November, but it's like he's doing something. The longevity of a pastor is the shortest it's ever been. Thousands of pastors are quitting. I've never thought about quitting, but I have thought about staying in bed. I have thought about long naps. I have thought about taking off a few days, but never have I ever thought about quitting because I can't. I just can't quit because he called me. I didn't call him. And I have to really trust him. You know, when they came out of, a, of Egypt, the children of Israel had to trust God for everything, their food, their drink, the shelter. You know, they didn't have SPF 50, you know, tanning lotion and sunscreen. It was a cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. The cloud covered them. Isn't that the greatest thing? Look what happens now. There's a move of God, then there's recourse. There's a move of God, and then there's recourse. The violent taketh by force. God begins to move. Here comes the violence. This is why we're seeing so much violence in the earth today, because God is moving. God is moving. Defund the police? Are you mad? Are you mad? Defund the police. Jesus is coming. There's a song called, you know, I fought the law and the law won. I know Eddie was talking about, because I'm reading John Bevere's book, Honor's Reward. If you don't show honor to your leaders, you will never be honored. You have to learn to honor civil authorities. Pray for Biden, amen? He's the only second Catholic president we've ever had. Pray for him. Pray for the vice president, secretary of state. Pray for the congressmen and senators. Pray for them, amen? Pray for them. So did you see the recourse? Now look what's happening. The apostles are arrested. Here comes the next wave of stories. Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 42. Let's begin in verse 17 in prison. Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Let's read it. Then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Verse 21. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. They made bail. They were put in prison. Angel Lord let them out. And he goes, go to the temple and preach the gospel. That's where God's name is. The council. Think about it. Let's look at the next situation among the council. It's pretty cool if you ask me. Gamaliel speaks. Acts chapter 5, verses 34 through 40. Now check this guy out. So now the council's all there, and this guy is going to speak. He's going to have a lot of wisdom. Good counsel. Listen to what he says here. Check this out. Let's all read it together in verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. A doctor of the law had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, 
Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Theodos, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who was slain and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. Verse 37. He's setting an example here. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Wasn't that a great counsel? So listen up, everybody. Please listen to me. Everything that you do in your faith, as you practice your faith, as you practice your faith, you are doing it for yourself. I am not here to debate the church and their service times are wrong. The days that they meet are wrong. We're not here to do that. We're not here to defend the Torah, its teachings and instructions, okay? It's not been done away with. We're not here to argue the fact. We're here to live the fact. We're here to live it and to express it. Young people, you were born for such a time as this. Don't blow it. 24,000 people died at Baal Peor of a plague because they just wanted to have fun in the world. The sexual immorality led to Idolatry, because that's what idolatry is. So young people, you have an opportunity. The promises have been given to you. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly, because once you taste of the Lord, it is good. I'm 55. I was my kid's age. I know what they're going through. I know when you're 17, you know it all. Then I share the story of Joseph. How old was he when he went in the pit? He was 17. We don't know it all. We don't have it all. We have to be cautious. Got to slow down. Now they're going to start to develop like a church government here. Seven are chosen in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. We're going to read Acts chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Seven are chosen. Check this out. Verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Now, what were they choosing these men for? Seven men chosen to take care of widows and serve tables so the disciples can preach the word of God. See? Because there was a need there. Now, remember, you're getting a mixture of Jews and Gentiles coming into this stuff. That's what's happening. Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So these seven men were chosen to take care of widows and serve tables so the disciples can preach the word of God. And look at what they have to be qualified for. Look at this. They have to be what? Men of good report, honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Servants, hospitality. Think of hospitality. Amen? So now Stephen is taken prisoner. Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. Now I want you to see this. It seems like he got a demotion. Oh, well, I, was, I want to preach, but the disciples are going to preach, so Stephen is going to become what? He's going to join the hospitality team with D, right? So he gets, you feel like, oh, he's kind of got demoted. Well, guess what? He got promoted. <laughs> Stephen is taken prisoner in Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. Look, let's look at verses 8 and 9. Here's Stephen. 
And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Listen to me closely, everybody. Stephen was willing to take a demotion. He was willing to say, I'm going to do hospitality, take care of widows, and, and, and do the tables. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So what happened? God promoted him because he humbled himself. You can't force yourself into a position of leadership. You can't exalt yourself. Jesus makes it very clear. If you're in the back, let them come get you and bring you to the front because it's better that way than to say, hey, I'm in the front, and they take you to the back. Listen, if we can't honor one another in here, because honor's reward is great, how will we ever honor the Jewish people in Judaism? Did you know that? We have to honor people's faith. Everybody has to make a decision for Christ. Everybody. I was almost 25 years of age, thank God, when I gave my life to the Lord. But everybody has to make that decision, Jew or non-Jew. That's their choice. Do you understand? So now he's taken prisoner. Acts chapter 6, verses 12 through 15. Let's read it, the council. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, this man seetheth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. One of the things that can defile our heart is a false witness. Go back and read what Jesus said. It's blasphemies, false witness, fornication, adultery. That's how your heart can be defiled. Their hearts were defiled with these lies. Stephen never said any such things. And I believe if, as we move forward here, Stephen's sermon in his Acts chapter 7, verses 1 through 60. Stephen's sermon is very powerful. It's like the gospel, you know, in a nice little compartment. The nuts and bolts are right there. The Reader's Digest condensed version. Stephen just gives it out. It's, it's a whole fascinating read. But guess what? Stephen is put to death. Acts 7, verses 54 through 60. Let's read this. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Yeshua standing up. He saw it. I've had sheets come down. When I used to read about Peter and the sheet coming down, I think, man, that's kind of wild. Boy, I've had a sheet come down and seen things, like a bulletin board or a neon sign. I've had, I've had things drop right in front of me in Beersheba and, and give me a, a revelation. The sheet came down. I, I, was, I was looking at the plains of Beersheba, and I was at the well where Abraham would have actually drank from this well. And I'm sitting there the second time I was there, because I taught about the 10 things that make up the Abrahamic covenant. And I looked out over the plain, and that sheet came down. And I'm like, whoa. And I, I got my paper, and I wrote it down. And at the top, it said, Abraham's children. And there were three subsets, three columns. The one to the far left were the Jews, the children of Israel, right? The Hebrews, here it goes, the, the Jews. And then, of course, from there dropped down the Jews for Jesus, the Messianic Jews. See, it dropped down like a subset. The Jews, Messianic Jews, boom. Then over here, to the far right, we'll just look at it like this. You, I, had, I saw it, it, there, there was, there was uh, Ishmael, right? Islam. And from Islam, it said radical Islam. But in the middle, it had what? It had the Christian, right? And then from the Christian, right? The nations, the Gentile, a little... Arrow drops down, and it said Hebrew roots. No, really, it did. It said, from Christianity has come Hebrew roots. But I mean, it's been hijacked. It's been misrepresented. But this is what got me, because I saw that, and then right underneath Hebrew roots, 
the arrow pointed and it said, Bait to Hela. And the Lord showed me, He said, Bait to Hela is mine. And he, he knows that it's not mine. Like Moses said, those are your children. They're not mine. You belong to him. So I want to just tell you this in all honesty. This congregation belongs to Yahweh. Amen. I can't do anything without him doing it. I wait, and then we make plans. We do things. We make decisions. We have a board. We have leadership. But I'm telling you right now, this place belongs to Yahweh. And you need to understand this. We're not just the church. This is Yahweh's house. You're his people. Amen? So, yeah, so I saw that. I've seen other things, too, about situations and stuff. Sheet would drop down and give revelation. But like the Lord was telling me, you know, you can't share this with everyone because it's not for them to know. Also, sometimes things that are revealed to us, he doesn't reveal to others. So what happens? We get frustrated. Like, I know this is the truth. I know this. But people don't listen. But it's okay. Because God is in control. He is sovereign. You're not going to hoodwink him. You're not going to trick him. You're not going to go around him. God's in control. Everything's happening in the earth so that God can get his children. Listen, I'm not perfect. Like I said, I can't believe that I'm up here sharing this message with you. All my me- I was scrolling through all my PowerPoints. I mean, there's hundreds. I, c- I got boxes of teachings. But I'm into fresh revelation. People will talk about last year, the year before. Do you remember? I go, no, I don't. Because the glory is ahead. I don't want old glory. I want new glory, new experiences. I don't have time for that stuff. Don't have time for old stuff. But look at verses 59 and 60. They stoned Stephen. Let's read it. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Look what happens. So Stephen has revival things happen. They grab him. They stone him. And now look what's going to happen. The congregation is persecuted. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. We're all going to be persecuted. Some of you are already persecuted. Look at, look at this, the church in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So the, the verse has been said in the church, we've all heard this before, that, that Saul of Tarsus held the coats of those that stoned Stephen. He held the coats, but this is what it actually says in Acts seven fifty eight: Lay down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So I don't, I don't want to assume anything. So I want you to think about this. Let's go back and look at this. So the Holy Spirit falls... Peter and John go out into the temple. They heal a lame man. They cause this ruckus. 5,000 people believe. All the signs and wonders are happening. They get into the council. Then they're released. They're beaten. All this happens. But look at this next slide. The gospel proclaimed in Samaria. Oh, this has never happened before. Jews would skip Samaria. They would go around Samaria. And what did Yeshua do? He went to Samaria and went to the well. This woman was married, what, five times and had the live-in boyfriend at the time? And he stays two days. <laughs> the gospel goes from Jerusalem in Judea, which are the Jews, to Samaria, which represents the Gentiles. Does anybody see that? The gospel to the Jew first. So let's look at what's going to happen in Samaria. Very interesting. Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. Let's read it. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Verse 7. Verse 7. Oh, for unclean spirits 
crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Amen? So Philip went into Samaria, which is north of Judea. Do you see this? It's, It's happening, isn't it? Let's look at the baptism in the Holy Ghost, Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, the laying on of hands in Samaria. Are you ready? Here we go. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17, then laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. You don't lay hands on someone to receive salvation. You lay hands on someone to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's real simple. Does everybody see that? So now we're going to switch gears a little bit now because now all of a sudden we have Simon the sorcerer in the mix. This is the, uh, the Holy Spirit versus the occult. The Holy Spirit versus the occult. Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 20. Here is Simon the source. Just a little tidbit here. Let's read it. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So he had to repent. Did you know that? He needed to repent. He needed to repent. It doesn't mix. It doesn't mix at all. And now we're going to have Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We're going to have Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Let's check it out. You guys ready? This is really good. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Let's read it together. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Divine appointments, verse 36. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. That quick, no baptism class. It was that quick. Verse 39. When they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through the... He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. The Lord caught away Philip. He was raptured. He was teleported to go somewhere else. I mean, you, you just read it for yourself, Right? Take the scriptures literally. Last slide. In Acts 9, we have Saul of Tarsus, who has a life-changing experience with Yeshua while on the road to Damascus. Saul of Tarsus will later become the apostle Paul sent to the Gentiles. So my last thoughts are this, just so you can all tie it in because it's so important. How many of you know that we have the Torah portion? And in the Torah portion, it's very interesting because it ties into Acts 2. Actually, it talks about in Numbers chapter 11, verses 16 and 17, 70 men or elders were chosen to take the spirit that Moses has upon them, that that's what God was going to do. I will take of the spirit which is upon thee and will put it upon them. So you're united. There's unity among the elders and the 70 70 men. And notice that 70 is the number for the nations. So I find it interesting that just like 
when they were speaking in tongues in Acts 2, and the Galileans were speaking like Italian and Spanish, those that understood that language received it. That's why the Lord was saying that I'm coming for my children. The lesser Elohim have to give them up. See, that's why you'll see in a lot of these countries, they're tightening the screws, they're making it harder. There's just there's horrible atrocities happening. Horrible atrocities. I can't even read them. You know, raping, killing of children. Because the father is coming for his children. Remember Egypt? Threw the babies in the water to drown them. In Bethlehem, kill all the babies two years and under. And I do believe Roe versus Wade will be reversed. Yes. Jonathan Kahn believes that the COVID-19, he, he, he estimates this, he, think, he thinks this, and it, it, it's something to ponder because it affected the older generation. They didn't do anything about the abortion. That generation went to sleep. And so when you see the COVID-19, it was those that are over a certain age were affected more than the younger ones. You can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. So we talked about that, the, the spirit of Moses being upon those people. See, the Holy Spirit was in the Old Testament. Right now, it's corporately now, see. Now the Holy Spirit has fallen upon the whole earth. But men had the Holy Spirit. Even Samson, the Spirit of God came upon him. The Spirit was upon David. You, know, you see what I'm saying? Now, now what's interesting is that in, in closing here, they were going to prophesy. They prophesied. It's Naba in the Hebrew. It means to speak or sing by inspiration in prediction or simple discourse. To predict. So we need people in the church, we need people in Beit Tehila that are going to prophesy the promises of God to us that are coming towards us that we will fulfill. It's not name it and claim it. It's not like that. It's like God is going to speak to us in regards to these promises so that we can walk them out together. And that's what's going to make us different. That's why I'm telling all of you this, I can't compete with the world. I can't go home with you. I can't go home with you. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing with your life. I know what I'm doing with my life. I only have you for a short time. I'm in competition, with, but I can't compete. You're going to have to make up your own minds. Some of you are doing it with your health, jobs, moving. All kinds of decisions are being made. And I pray that you are the road that you are on leading to God. I got a great work to do here. I didn't think one thought about going to Israel. I don't miss it because one day I'll be there forever. I'll live across the street from Jesus and borrow milk every day. It's Nick again. He wants some milk. Now, now listen to me. What spirit do we have? So I just shared with you in Numbers that the spirit that was given to Moses was given to the 70 elders to help to be of one mind, one body, not to come against. Do you get that? Now, that's the, that's the Torah portion. And it said that they prophesied to speak or sing by inspiration in prediction or simple discourse to predict. But what about the half Torah in Zechariah? Chapter 4, verse 6. What about in Zechariah? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. See, we don't have to exert all this effort to make this happen or come to pass. It's happening. Things are coming to pass. Do you guys get that? Tied in with Acts chapter 2, verse 17, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. To prophesy. Prophetuo. That's the Greek word. It means to foretell events. Divine. Speak under inspiration. Exercise the prophetic office. It's all right there, everyone. It's all right there. Get alone with God to where you hear him clearly, clearly, clearly. Because these young people in here are going to start prophesying. That was the word the Lord gave me for this generation. 
It's not has nothing to do with Facebook, Instagram, the social media. It has nothing, absolutely nothing to do, nothing to do with it, nothing. It has to do with what God wants to speak to us through them. From this. Amen. So, Father, thank you for your presence. This is your house, your people. Father, Beit Heal belongs to you. And I pray, Father, you'll just circumcise our hearts. Help us get rid of the chaff. Help us to be focused and encourage one another and love one another, respect one another. It's about love, respect, and unity, Father. And I pray that. The enemy has nothing against unity, Father. So, Father, unless you build this house, we labor in vain. Thank you for the opportunities you've given us. Thank you for this trip to Israel as they come back, Father. Let's be prepared. Let's be ready for the next chapter in this church. We thank you, Father, for this, and we ask this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone.